Welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell. This podcast features in-depth explorations into the traditions of yoga, Sanskrit, Indian philosophy, and South Asian religions. Through candid conversations with scholars and practitioners, we will immerse in the latest and most cutting-edge research on all things yoga. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode eight of the Yogic Studies podcast. Today, we'll be speaking with Dr. Shravana Borkataki Varma, currently at Harvard University and the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Shravana and I had a rich conversation where she shares some of her experiences growing up in India, receiving initiation into a Shakta Tantra lineage, her discovery and entry into religious studies and the academic path, as well as her dissertation uh, fieldwork on the role of female practitioners, tantric sexual rights. We also discuss her teaching uh, online at Yogic Studies and being censored online by Facebook, as well as uh, her recent research on online puja services and so much more. Dr. Shravana Borkataki Varma is a historian, educator, and social entrepreneur who holds a PhD in religions from Rice University. As a historian, she studies Indian religions focusing on esoteric rituals and gender, particularly in Hindu Shakta Tantra traditions. As an educator, she is currently working as a lecturer at Harvard University and at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where she teaches introductory courses on world religions and higher level courses and seminars on Hinduism, Buddhism, religion and film, and the history of yoga. In the past, she's also taught at the University of Houston, University of Montana, Rice University, and Dalian Newsoft University in China. In a previous non-academic avatar, Shravana worked in customer service, in the financial and IT industry. As a social entrepreneur, she is the co-founder of a nonprofit called Lumen Tree Portal. Shravana invests in building communities with individuals from various faith backgrounds who believe in kindness, compassion, and fulfillment. And as you'll hear more about in today's episode, Shravana recently taught a wonderful online course for us here at Yogic Studies entitled YS106, Shakta Tantra, Yoga, and Hindu Goddess Traditions. This course is now available for self-study. And so if you enjoy this conversation today with Shravana and you'd like to study Shakta Tantra and Hindu goddess traditions further with her, we highly recommend this course. Our listeners can receive 20% off the tuition by using the promo code SHRAVANA20. That's all caps, S-R-A-V-A-N-A and the number 20. And you can go to yogicstudies.com forward slash YS dash 106 to register and learn more. All right, everyone, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this wide ranging conversation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shravana Borkataki Varma. All right, Shravana, welcome to Yogic Studies Podcast. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to have you here. Thank you so much, Seth. It really is a pleasure. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you reaching out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we enjoyed your course so much that you taught um, last year and uh, really received a lot of positive feedback from the community and in fact, a lot of people have been requesting, you know, when are you going to do a podcast episode with Shravana? And so I'm really glad that um, we were able to find the time and uh, to have this conversation. <laughs> now, this is really, uh, you know, just going back to the course, I know we've spoken before briefly, but uh, I really hats off to you for creating the community that you have created. Um, it is warm. It is open. It is so welcoming, uh, and I think we need more yogic studies for uh, 
you know, loving, accepting, understanding world today. Mm. Well, I appreciate that very much. And uh, I'm excited to have you on here today to uh, discuss your, your interesting scholarship and your professional work on Hinduism, on Shakta Tantra, and um, your, your research, but also to get to know the scholar a little bit and to learn a little bit about your story and kind of what has brought you to, to do this interesting work today. And I think you have a particularly interesting and rich background as somebody who's both an insider and a scholar to the tradition that you study. And so why don't we begin, uh, maybe you can tell us just um, you know, a brief version of your story and how you came to academia and the study of Hindu Tantra. Um, so religion was something that had always fascinated me. I'm from India uh, originally. And uh, as a child, um, we used to live in a state called Orissa. And that's where I lived for uh, the first 13 years of my life. And uh, Orissa has the Jagannath Temple uh, in Puri, uh, which is uh, one of the you know, temples which is considered very sacred. Uh, and so um, I kind of grew up in this kind of uh, uh, immersion in religion from a very young age. Uh, none of my family members, not, you know, now that when I look back, were really into religion, but something always fascinated me. Uh, so um, one thing led to the other, and I didn't know at that time what was that one thing led to the other. I only retrospectively got to understand a lot more of my own history, but at the age of about 14, 15, uh, I was initiated uh, in Kamakya mm -hmm. and uh, I was given Diksha. That's quite uh, far from Orissa. How did you get yes, there? So, uh, oh, yes, I should have mentioned. So I'm from Assam. So my family uh, comes from Assam. And uh, the, the way things happened was the, the, the person uh, who um, gave me uh, the initiation, he was actually, uh, you know, he was a family friend and he, um, his mom was my mom's friend. So it kind of like that kind of a connection. And uh, so um, essentially it was much later I got to understand. So at 15, you don't understand these things. I didn't even mm. ask any questions. Mm. And um, many people think the initiation is a very big, you know, a very large event or a special event. Um, but the way it was done for me was, uh, you know, stripped of all kinds of fanfare. Um, and uh, so I thought it was a very, you know, everybody went through it. I assume my sister, I have one older sister, so I assume my sister went through it. Mm. Uh, much later in life, I realized she had not uh, gone through the initiation. Um, so it started there. Uh, and, um, and so this is a Shakta Tantra tradition located yes. at Kamakya in, in, in Assam. And so your family had some connections to uh, to a priest or to the temple there. Was it was it a family tradition or it was sort of no. something that you it sounds like kind of struck up an interest in on your own? Yes. Yeah, so um, so much later, it was only uh, in my PhD. What I understood was it was you know when we are born, a, a, a horoscope is made uh, traditionally. And so it seems that in my horoscope, it was written that I would be, I would become a guru and I would uh, kind of uh, be part of a temple. Mm. And uh, I obviously had no idea about this. Um, and I do, however, vaguely remember through the early childhood uh, telling my father, who I call Baba, I would, uh, you know, say, Baba, Baba, you know, so-and-so has passed away or uh, this is going to happen to so-and-so. So, you know, I would have the, I would kind of relay these messages um, to, to Baba. And so uh, that is what kind of led. So uh, before this initiation, uh, you know, that's what, how, I, I don't remember that uh, period, but I was taken to a temple in Jorhat, uh, which is in Upper Assam. 
And uh, there was a set of rituals uh, done for me because my parents really uh, didn't know what to do with the child who uh, seems to be getting some kind of messages. Mm. Um, and so there was, uh, you know, so I would say that would be maybe my initiation 1.0. Mm. Um, but that was, as my dad remembers, it should be about eight or nine years old. Um, and then this kind of continued and my interest. And by the time I came to 15, again, I don't remember much of it, but how my parents remember is that I started talking about becoming a nun. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I, uh, so that's how uh, they, they, I guess they must have consulted this family friend, the family friend knew someone in Kamakya. And that's how I was initiated. So I was given, you know, as as the initiation goes, uh, I was given a, 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 a mantra. I was given, uh, I was assigned an Ishta Devi or a cherished goddess, uh, patron saint, however you want to translate it. Uh, and so life went on uh, and uh, one went through life, assuming uh, everybody does this, assuming everyone in the family has their own set of mantras. And uh, interestingly, when we, get initiated one of the things that is always said is that you don't you know you don't share the mantra or you don't uh, talk about this initiation so I never spoke about it uh, you know it was just one of those assumed parts of life um, so then I did my undergrad in English literature but I didn't quite like it and that's when I decided to um, study Buddhism mm. And, was, that, was, that, was that still in India where you did your yeah, undergrad? I was still in India. And uh, so I did my master's in Buddhist studies looking at the Vinaya. Uh, and, uh, and that is when I really, truly, for the first time, studied with other monks. Um, and, uh, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Hmm. Um, given a choice, I would have you know, my, my urge or my desire to become a nun was even more prominent. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what I realized is that, again, you know, I had a wonderful professor um, at, at that time, Professor Sarau, uh, Katie Sarau, and, um, and we had several conversations and I would say he would be my first mentor uh, in this journey. And mm. he told me that, you know, um, Shravna, you don't have to become a nun in the sense of donning the robes uh, to follow this path. Uh, and I still remember this was Delhi University sitting in his office hours after hours. And uh, we talked about it. And I understood, um, you know, the the challenges of donning the robe and uh, and your our own religious path, our own vows, um, our own um, rituals, or um, you know the rules that we follow. We don't need a set of robes, uh, and uh, we can still um, have a very fulfilling spiritual life without having to don the robes. So. I decided not to don the ropes, but I decided to um, to keep a lot of my vows, uh, which I have done till date, uh, and I intend to do so. Um, so uh, I finished my master's in Buddhism, but life happened, and I realized that you know uh, there, there was no way I could have uh, uh, you know uh, that, that there is no way to find a good source of income with uh, with masters in with the studies uh, I'm, I'm an expert of the vinaya of the ethical <laughs> codes of buddhist monks and nuns not the most lucrative uh, <laughs> expertise no not at all and this was 1998 <laughs> india and uh, there's no religious studies happening and uh, so you know if you really wanted to pursue as a woman in this whole religious space and i was never um, never really you know my heart was never into a deep study of sanskrit so i studied sanskrit till masters we start we started uh, sanskrit in fifth grade in you know elementary school and i went all the way to masters so i studied sanskrit mm. but i studied sanskrit sanskrit never you know it didn't draw on my heartstrings and uh, i knew that 
therefore I would, you know, there was no way I, I could even visualize myself doing a PhD in Sanskrit, for example, right? So mm -hmm. it, it was just not something that, that, that spoke to me. And I've always been some, someone uh, who listens to that voice. Um, and so life went on and this was um, the time in India where, you know, it was about a decade or so after the economy uh, was open to foreign direct investments. There was a private sector, there were lots of jobs. So believe it or not, my first job was with General Electric. Mm. Uh, a U.S. company in the human resources. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's where I started my career, and um, and I uh, continued with this in this um, human resource customer service uh, industry until two thousand five. Um, uh, when I left in two thousand five, I was uh, with uh, with Standard Chartered Bank. It's a bank based out of United Kingdom. And I used to head there, um, there was, there's a credit card called Manhattan uh, credit card. So I used to head their customer service of uh, Pan India. Were you, and were you still located in India when you were doing They're that Located work? in India, yes. And, uh, you know, a part of you um, kind of wondered what life would be if you became a, a, a religious scholar. Uh, but you you kind of shut it out because you know uh, economics mattered, um, and but as I became more and more successful in the corporate industry, uh, what I did realize is that I was not necessarily happy. Um, I, I had money. I, I you know I earned a lot more money, a lot faster than um, you know what. Uh, my parents did at their, you know, with, without the, in, in just government jobs. So um, yes, there was, there was money, but, you know, there was, there was a part of me and I was becoming someone, it, someone that I didn't want to become. So then life took, uh, took my family uh, to China. And that's where I would say 2.0 began, right? So in China, I, um, I, the plans were to work with Standard Chartered Bank. But when I reached China, we lived in a city called Dalian, uh, which is in the north of China. Uh, and what I realized was the banking industry was just so alien to me. I did not understand anything. I didn't know the language. Mm -hmm. and so. That made me very nervous. Where, where in China is Dalian? Uh, north of China. So this is next to the, uh, it's, it's in the North Korea, uh, China border. Mm. So right mm. up there. So it's not Beijing or Shanghai. Yeah. So probably very little English spoken. Oh my God. You know, there was barely any English. This was 2000. Five. Yeah, mm. that was 2005. There was no English. Uh, grocery stores had no English. It was mm -hmm. it was quite the adventure. Yeah, yeah. My um, wife and I, Charlotte and I, we lived in northeastern China for three months in 2011, mm. and it was it was an incredible experience, but very difficult for those reasons you're describing. Yes. Very yes. foreign and and just language and cultural barrier was much yes. higher than most of my other travels. Yes. Yes, and and we underestimate. Um, you know, I have studied in Germany before, uh, and we've traveled a lot. So you know, one one assumes one can just you know use the same set of uh, tools um, to settle in China, but um, mm -hmm. that's not true. Um, yeah, you need you really need to invest in some amount of language training, which I had not. Um, so, and then, you know, just, there were so many, uh, factors. Um, so, so very quickly, um, you know, once we reached there, I decided not to be with the banking industry anymore within the first month. And as luck would have it the same month, I got, a, a teaching job at Dalian New Soft University. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was uh, to teach the graduating um, uh, population, uh, you know, kind of getting them trained uh, to uh, to to get these um, the, the the jobs that that were coming, the IT jobs that were coming to Dalian. Mm, so, I was going to say it wasn't a religious studies department. In China, oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> in fact, we were told not to ever discuss about religion. I oh no, 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 we had that same experience. And in fact, you know, sorry to interject, but um, mm-hmm. we taught English at a high school in mm. uh, northeastern China, oh, yeah. Xi'an, and we had to go to the police department to register as teachers, and we had to show them our college degrees or university we degrees. Do. Yes. Yeah. And my degree is in religious studies. And they looked at it and they looked at me and they said, do you have another one? Yes. And I was like, yeah, let me just pull out, <laughs> let me just whip out another degree. But the, the fact that my major was in religion was um, controversial. And, oh my God, yes. And it was, <clears throat> you know, it's very, it's very misunderstood. And religion, you know, as you know, um, there's, there's just, there's a whole history and discourse, you know, about how religion has been handled and continues to be handled in China at the government and institutional levels. And it was, it was a complicated factor in my hiring, the fact that that was what my degree was. Oh my God. And so mine is exactly that times a little extra because one, now I'm at a university. Two, Mm -hmm. I come from India. I studied Buddhism and I studied Mm -hmm. Tibetan. Oh, yes. And I come from the northeast of India, which anyway has a contested border with China. Mm. Yep. So, yes. Yeah, so, you know, uh, like you, I whipped out my, so uh, I, I forgot to tell you. So, because I was going through my corporate journey, I thought uh, I would get an MBA. So I got an MBA while I was working in the, in the corporate uh, space. So I actually showed my MBA degree and oh, took away the Buddhist perfect. studies degree. Oh my God. I, I didn't know. No, see, I knew. See, uh, you did have the other degree in your back pocket. You could whip yes. that out. I did not. <laughs> Oh, I did. I did. And exactly that. And then, you know, you would have also signed that agreement, the 10 pointer that you're not supposed to discuss in classroom. Right. Yeah, I remember uh, that. And, and religion is one of them. Yep. And I had the same thing. And uh, so, but what that did was it, it, you know, it reignited a spark in me. I loved my, you know, I'm getting the chills right now, just thinking about that time. I loved interacting with uh, college students. I loved, you know, just kind of, and yes, it had nothing to do with religion. It was entirely to do with English and, and kind of getting ready for interviews and whatnot. But it kind of took me to a space which where I saw myself happy again, mm-hmm. and uh, and so that is where um, that is where you know it kind of was like wait so I just fine I didn't become a nun so I don't I, I'm not joining a monastery uh, I've kept my vows great I love religion great uh, corporate world was needed to earn some money fine. Now, how do I put these different elements together? And that's when uh, we, uh, we came to uh, United States, we came to Houston. Mm. That's where we've been now for uh, 2007 to to 13 years. Yeah, we've been in Houston for 13 years now. That's quite a leap from India to northern China to Houston, Texas. Yes, it is. But, um, but Houston, we actually chose because we loved Houston. Um, we, you know, I was so there were certain factors I put in. I said I don't want to stay in that kind of deep dead winter because you know China North mm-hmm. winter is extreme winter. So I was like, I don't want to go again and uh, you know live in that kind of winter. So then that uh, you know removed some options. We did have the Bay Area as one option and Houston is another option. Mm. Uh, and then when we did the cost analysis of <laughs> living in the Bay Area in Houston, we were yeah. like, okay, we are going to Houston. So and yeah. uh, and the no brainer. Heat, yeah, and the heat and the humidity never really was a big factor for us. Sure. We come from India. Sure, it feels like home. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The heat, the humidity totally feels like home. Um, so, um, so yeah, so we came to Houston and then um, we came. Uh, so my husband, uh, you know, worked for the company and uh, we came in kind of an 
ex, you know, in a kind of a program which has like an express citizenship thing. Uh, so it's not the usual path that people follow. Uh, so, but for the first eight months, um, I could not work. Uh, it was the eight months where, you know, the paperwork was uh, happening and the, the, the lawyer said, you know, just wait for eight months and it was fine. And it was a new country. And I was like, okay, I, I'm going to kind of experience everything. And eight months is not a long time. Mm. And that was, uh, I would say, a uh, greatest gift of the universe. You know, uh, I read it much later. I don't even remember the author, but somewhere I read, when you pause, is when meaning comes to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I paused, right? I mean, I went on and on and on and on since I was born till, to, uh, till 2007. And then I paused. Uh, and it's the, it's the kumbhaka, the retention. Uh, yes. <laughs> and so, uh, and that's when I, um, you know, we started talking, what do I want to do? And I still remember my husband saying, uh, you know, you really were happy uh, being uh, in, in uh, you know, in religion. So why don't you pursue it? And I still remember laughing at him and saying, are you kidding me? Have you not seen me? I'm so old. Who's going to, you know, uh, take me? I didn't know that, uh, the, you know, you can go to grad school at different ages because that that was not really a thing in India. Mm. And so, um, so, yeah, one thing led to the other. And in 2008, I uh, met Jeffrey Kripal, Professor Jeffrey Kripal at, um, at um, Rice University. At that time, he was the chair. Um, right, and right there in Houston. So you were already right there. there. Yes. And the reason I met him is because he was the chair of the department. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember uh, walking in. I still remember that day, uh, you know, I, I'm stepping into Rice University. I am like, oh my God. I mean, this is so different from Delhi University. And Rice University is a beautiful campus. Um, so I met with him and I told him this is what I wanted to. And I wanted to study Buddhism uh, because that's, mm -hmm. you know, I was coming with a master's in Buddhism. So uh, that's what I thought. So he then introduced me to Professor Anne Klein who was again at Rice, and I remember having conversations with Anne uh, about what I wanted to. I had no idea about, uh, you know, that people actually come with a defined project into the grad school. <laughs> right. I just literally showed up, and all I know was, I want to study religion, and you are mm. teaching religion. And um, so, yeah, so um, so several conversations in Anne and Jeff um, truly, truly held my hand in the first, uh, I would say, year. And then Professor Bill Parsons uh, came into the picture. He's all, you know, this, these are all people at Rice. So they mm -hmm. all then, one by one, came, came into my life. And, um, and just like that, uh, I wrote my, you know, what do we write? GRE, GMAT, one of the things we write, I don't even remember what we write. What Something we write to get into grad school. Oh, uh, the, with the, app, the statement of purpose. No, but the exam that you have to write, right? You, the, you have to write a GRE or a... Oh, or, to get, yeah, you have to take that stupid GRE exam. Yes. Uh, <laughs> which measures nothing that yes. will, will, will actually quantify or qualify your skills to do this kind of yes. research. Yes, exactly, right? And so we had to, I had to write the GRE and I remember telling uh, Jeff, I was like, oh my God, are you serious? I have to not study math. Why do I have to study math to study religion? But anyway, um, yeah. it all, you know, when, when, when things have, have, have to happen, they happen. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so yep, I started my, um, my grad school um, uh, unofficially in 2009, officially in 2010. And I started with uh, Buddhism, mm. uh, but uh, within a year, and this is uh, how things again change. So this mm -hmm. was, uh, end, you know, coming to the end of second year, and I read Lorelai Bernarke's renowned Goddess of Desire. Mm. And I remember it was a spring afternoon, and this I was doing an independent study with Jeff, and we were sitting under this giant giant beautiful tree at rice campus 
And I remember asking, and that um, we, we read Renowned Goddess of Desire, uh, Laura Lai's book and um, David White, uh, White's Alchemical Body. Mm. So we were, uh, for some reason, we read these two books together and it was an independent study. And I remember sitting there and asking Jeff saying, wait, so what about women? Mm. You know, how do women, what about women's bodies, the physical bodies of women? What happens in the ritual space? And, and uh, I don't know if you've read uh, Lorelai's book, she uh, takes more of the, uh, the notion that Tantra is empowering to women. And then, um, and then, you know, there are other scholars who uh, later I will find uh, say that no, it is, uh, it is abusive towards women. And here I'm sitting as a woman who comes from the tradition and I'm like, wait, I neither feel empowered or abused. Mm -hmm. And so what are you guys talking about? So suddenly I had Hugh Urban's work, Lorelai's work, Rachel McDermott's work, um, David's work, and I'm reading all of them and I'm having this reaction of sorts, right? And like, you know, I, I can understand everything, yet it is not really resonating and so I that's when um, I went to Jeff and I told Jeff Jeff I don't you know so Jeff said well I don't know you have to find the answer and that's how this journey began so mm. I changed my uh, my field so I went from um, Buddhism uh, to uh, you know to to Tantra Shakta Tantra but I didn't really feel I was changing a lot because if you look at Tibetan Buddhism and Shakta Tantra especially when we look at in Karmakya there is a lot of overlap so you know it was not it was not like a drastic uh, change yet there was a change mm. but the first two years is where I think I, it was more a journey into self because that was the time I had to, um, I had to really understand with regards to, um, you know, with regards to um, what happened from that nine, 10 year old until uh, 2012, 2011, uh, my life. So I actually spent the first two years of grad school reading scholarship, but being very introspective. So I went back several times, back to Kamakya, back to uh, my roots, asked questions. And that was a time when I actually lost my religion. Mm. Uh, it was very difficult set. I think it was one of the most difficult, um, one of the most difficult times of my life because I realized, you know, the curtain, uh, and I write, uh, I, I say this in my dissertation, the curtain was lifted. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the curtain was lifted, what I saw was not necessarily all pretty. Mm. Uh, what I saw was all kinds of things. And because I was initiated, I did get a lot of access. Uh, and, and so access for me was never a problem. Access into these very closed communities was never an issue. But it was almost like I have you know, from 15 until 2012, I lived a life which I felt was, so, uh, I don't want to say lie, but also not a life of complete knowledge. Yeah, I, I think it's really important what you're saying. And I think, I think this happens to, to some degree in grad school, whether you're initiated and really an insider to the tradition to the degree that you are, or even if you're even more of an outsider like myself, mm -hmm. I think it's probably even more pronounced in, in your experience and case. But I think a lot of us will go into grad school with certain romanticized notions and ideas mm -hmm. about the traditions, about the texts and practices that we're interested in studying. Mm -hmm. For me in the yoga world, just things that I had inherited from yoga teachers and yoga classes and my yoga trainings, but also from my time in India 
from my mm -hmm. time spent studying with, with teachers across various traditions, from within traditions, who are giving often not the full picture, not the full historical context, not the full textual context of where these things are coming from. Mm -hmm. And so my experience was, was similar to that in my first couple years of grad school, it felt like the deconstruction of a lot mm -hmm. of those essentialized and romanticized ideas. Mm -hmm. And it can be pretty dismantling, even existentially for students mm -hmm. who are sort of left to pick back up the pieces. You know, when you start questioning even the categories of knowledge, what is Hinduism? What is mm -hmm. Tantra? What is mm -hmm. Shaktism? And then you mm -hmm. start to, you start to dismantle and understanding the complexity and layers and histories behind these terms and categories. Mm -hmm. But we then have, we have to pick them back up, right? Mm -hmm. We can't just throw them out completely. No. And so as your studies continued, how did, how did you sort of come back from that? And how did your, the, the nature and scope of your research start to focus uh, and particularly then on Kamakya, how were you able to find uh, this balance then between your experiences and your research? So um, I think I found finally my balance and it was, you rightly said, the deconstruction is so intense. And for me, it was almost like a life that I lived, yet I did not know anything about. And so it was, it, so, so this led to um, a trip to Tara Beat, actually. And so Kamakya did not put me together. Uh, mm -hmm. It was Tara Beat in West Bengal uh, that put me back together. Um, and just for so, listeners, just kind of tell us what, what, is, what is Tara Beat? So Tara Beat is, again, a, a Shakta temple uh, in uh, West Bengal in the Birbhum district. And, um, and it is, uh, even today, a lot of what would be called as esoteric rituals are still pretty much prevalent in part of that temple. Now, does that mean there are other uh, goddess temples where esoteric rituals don't happen? No, they happen, but they don't happen necessarily in public. Uh, in Tarapit, uh, the some of the esoteric rituals is still very much part of the uh, of the public space. For example, the cremation crown. You can, you know, anybody who wishes to go to the cremation ground in Tarapit can go. Mm -hmm. And then there are uh, lots of practitioners and lots of people who've lived in those uh, cremation grounds for decades. Uh, so they have their little shanties uh, constructed and they have practiced uh, uh, in Tharapit for, um, for, as I said, decades and decades. Um, so I was doing uh, field work um, and, and this was not field work so much focused on my PhD research at that time, it was more a field work on my own self, right? It was like a, a journey into self. And uh, I, 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 somebody told me about Tara Pete, so I decided uh, to go to Tara Pete. And, um, and there I met uh, a lady by the name of Gorima. And, uh, and two sisters, Gorima and Sundarima. Mm. And, um, and slightly older women. So I think Gorima, although she says she's 35, 36, I don't think so. I think she's more like in her 50s, <laughs> which I think is too cute. Uh, and then uh, her sister Sundarima, uh, both are um, both uh, bo like, you know, they, they are a blend of the Aghori uh, tradition and Shakta Tantra traditions. They kind of um, uh, practice a blend of two, which again is not unusual in the field. Uh, and so she was the one who, so I, you know, I was asking her about rituals. I was asking about women. I was asking about how, what does this journey look like to you? How do you perceive your own physical body when you're part of these rituals? And, and, you know, they, she, 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 she had a good sense of humor, but she was also very chatty. So she kept going, you know, would keep 
going round and round in circles and would never answer anything. Uh, and then I would always keep persisting. But finally, one day she said, I will tell you and I will tell you everything uh, that I know if you promise to tell my story and your story to the world and you, you, you stay brave. So honestly, I did not know what, what it meant, but you know, I was in the field, I, I got carried away and I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. I, why shall I be scared? So I made all kinds of promises at that time because you know, I, I, as I said, it was so exciting that there was somebody, a woman, or in, in this case, two women who were ready to talk to me without any filters. And, uh, and so I made the promise and Again, not unusual, you know, when you make these kind of promises, you do it a little bit ritualistically. So, you know, she, she did a havan and she, she made me promise and I promised. And then she told me, uh, or rather, again, a second set of curtains were lifted. And that's when I got introduced to Shavasadhana. Um, I got introduced to some of the practices that kind of loosely get bracketed under this big umbrella or a large umbrella called kundalini yoga hmm. i um I Are those, that was that a term that she used uh shabasadana shabasadana no, no she used kundalini yoga too uh, but uh, but you know it is not necessarily how kundalini yoga is seen in the modern west today uh, there are elements of how she defines kundalini yoga and that is what will finally become my dissertation topic as i looked at kundalini yoga and women's bodies uh, but what that did was I, I i i all of a sudden was privy to so much of information on the practice side um, that um, that i you know, I would not have had if not for my initiation and if not for my own, um, you know, seeking my own journey. Uh, but what that did was it brought about uh, about six months later when I started really transcribing all my thoughts, all my notes uh, and so forth. Um, that was the second wave of crisis because I was scared. I was petrified. I was so, so, so worried to, to, to talk about it because, uh, you know, by this time we know there is so much of censorship in, uh, in the Tantra space, um, you know, there is just so much of negativity attached to it as if you remember you and I and what we faced with Facebook. Mm. Um, yeah. And I, and I want, I want to get into that in a little bit. So we'll, okay. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk but about you know, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you have family, you have friends uh, who all consider the minute they hear Tantra, they, they, they kind of come down with a very different lens and then there is also the public censorship, right? I mean, we have seen so much of censorship in the in, in academia, uh, so much of uh, hate, so much of intolerance uh, that I got really worried because here I was doing mm. a PhD. Uh, of course, with dreams to now teach in academia, mm. uh, to write in academia, and then I I was worried. I I was so scared, and at the same time, I didn't want to run away from religion again. I did once already, and I didn't want to. And so I decided, come what may, I will keep my pledge to Gorima. And mm. I, I said, if she, as in, you know, with limited means, not necessarily, uh, she's not at all, she never went to school. So with no formal education, uh, lives in a cremation ground, um, in a, in a, you know, in a, in a, tin shanty kind of a place. Um, if she had the courage to lead her life the way she has, and if she trusted me, because she had said in Bengali, and if I put it in quotes, it is, do not get scared. 
promise me you will not get scared. And I promised her, yes, I didn't know what I was promising. And I, you know, I didn't know what I, what the, you know, what I was going to experience once she took me into that world. So I decided um, to, um, to keep that promise. And therefore I decided to be very public about my, uh, my, uh, you know, my, my um, standing in academia. So I, I call myself an insider with an outsider lens, which means I am a practitioner of Shakta Tantra. I come from the left-handed practice. Uh, I, um, I have practiced it for uh, since I was 15, I continue to do so, uh, yet I study uh, it in an academic fashion, which means I also critique it. And I believe that there is a respectful way of critiquing it as long as we don't become reductive. And so I don't take on a reductive lens. Um, I take on a constructive lens. Uh, and yes, there are certain aspects. It is a challenge to put any kind of constructive lens, but so be it. Um, so I, I lean a lot on Anne Taves, uh, you know, uh, way how she looks at religious experience, where she uh, talks about experience deemed religious. So I really use that lens. Um, and rather, rather than religious experience, re rather than religious experience. So I moved away from religious experience because that was that comes with a set of assumptions that comes with a set of, um, you know, a, a, a set of things that you have to qualify to say it was a religious experience. And um, I think if my work does not fit there, Gaurima doesn't fit there, mm. uh, Sundarima doesn't fit there, and all the other women that I have met in the field, um, and I've met quite a few. So Gaurima and Sundarima would be what would be known as consorts um, mm. in Shakta Tantra. Um, and so I've met wives of uh, male gurus. I have met and interviewed and worked with women gurus. Uh, and so um, given the spectrum of, um, of women, I have now, you know, I've worked since to 2013, but more so I would say from about 2015. So the last five years has really been my journey into this. Um, I said, I have to be brave. I cannot, I cannot represent them. I cannot talk about them and I cannot do justice to them if I start getting scared. What's the big deal that would happen? I would not get a job mm. uh, or uh, somebody would not read my scholarship. And I'm anyway a slow writer. It takes me a long time to write, uh, unlike some of our colleagues. But I'm like, not, not me, not me, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Shravana, there's so many interesting threads in what you have just shared with us. Um, now, okay, so you were talking about how you 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 kind of were were placed with with what th this responsibility to share Gorima and and Sundarima's stories and information and practices, and that this really shifted the focus of your own research. But then you 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 were afraid to kind of come out with this to the academy. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like there's a few reasons why that is, but I wonder if we might unpack that a little bit more because I think it's really important because it says about, you know, how Tantra is perceived publicly within the academy. I was also wondering, you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but I wonder if some of what you were feeling, you know, about how your work would be perceived if this was your topic if that had anything to do with just working under Jeffrey Kripal, because his work, as some of our listeners might know, uh, has been the result of, of quite a bit of controversy, his mm -hmm. work on Tantra and on Ramakrishna. And uh, I think the backlash from the reception of his work has been mm -hmm. so severe, it's really altered the nature of, of his own research and work mm -hmm. quite a bit, right? And yes, so and I'm sure you've had those conversations. Oh my with God. Michael, and I oh. wonder if, yeah. you know, if you guys were navigating the topic in, in that way, 
you know, because he knows better than anybody of how, you know, uh, your your work might be perceived, you know, whether it's correctly or incorrectly, but the sort of stigma that can then follow you for your career based on, you know, your dissertation work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we call ourselves Wendy Doniger's grandchildren. <laughs> Right. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I've heard. Because <laughs> Jeff is the first, uh, Jeff, David, Jude, uh, you know, all of them were the first. And then so we, 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 we joke and we say we are uh, Wendy's grandchildren. Um, oh, for the, my God. For the Doniger Parampara. Yeah, the Doniger Parampara, therefore the Doniger censorship and whatnot. Uh, oh, my God, Seth. Hours hours and hours and hours of conversation because Jeff was also equally worried, right? Uh, I mean, imagine him. He didn't want to be in a position where um, he has a student now come out and before she even comes to the scene, goes through all kinds of censorship or, uh, you know, everything else that comes with it. And, oh my God, we spoke so much about it. Um, and every time I had a meeting, uh, we I came back, and then it always came back to that I promised Garima, mm-hmm. um, and so it, and and therefore uh, that's the reason why my dissertation has not been uh, public, uh, like you know, has not been released for public viewing. It's embargoed with rice. I was wondering about that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so because you know. Uh, because really, and the reason was not because I'm ashamed or I want to hide or I'm scared anymore. It was just that both Jeff and I felt that I need a few more years to start finding my constructive voice because dissertation is a dissertation, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, my dissertation is like this giant uh, data set of things that I saw on the field. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily go into every uh, every case study and then analyze it or theorize it or or kind of. So now I'm doing that, right? So now I'm starting to. So I'm working right now on a chapter on the hijras mm. and how the hijras, ha- you know, how how gender uh, is a constructed identity, and then how ritual, especially in Shakta Tantra, and I, in my case, it's always just Kamakya, and I talk about uh, Amuvachi Mela, how, uh, how we transcend these gender norms. Uh, so, uh, so now I'm starting to uh, kind of unpack these, these different, um, you know, different uh, experiences categories of people and experiences and so forth so yes oh my god um we spoke about it endlessly uh, but uh, and, and it is so true uh because because it is it is it is scary you you don't want to be a grad student who nobody will touch or you don't mm-hmm. want to be a grad student where um you know uh, they would not want to hear you um and and so but then I said, I, again, you know, everything takes me back to Gorima and my own journey. Uh, what does she have said? She has nothing, right? I mean, she barely, she doesn't know where her next meal will come from. Okay, if she has that kind of courage, because her statement, if I continue the quote was, people think I'm a prostitute and I am not a prostitute. You go out and you have the you have the means. When she said means, you meant education. So she said, you take the next plane, you go and you tell the world that Gorima and Sundarima are not prostitutes. When we are part of the ritual space, it's a choice we have made. Now, yes, the choice is very debate. You know, we can debate about it endlessly. There are all kinds of frameworks we will use, but for her, her entire endeavor is for me to go to the world and say people like Sundarima, people like Gorima, people like so many other uh, Ma's or Devi's or, uh, you know, that whatever titles we give them, they are not prostitutes. And so, so why, Let's get into the tradition a little bit more and into your field work and what and what's going on there. Um, you know, with 
with with saying as much as as comfortable you know uh, of course in honoring you know Gori Ma's privacy although it sounded sounds like she she does want you to share this with the world so what better place than the yogic studies podcast mm-hmm. but to just take us into the tradition a little bit um i think one of the things that's so interesting and important about your work is that this is a living tradition of shakta tantra mm-hmm. Right. I mean, a lot of a lot of the work that I do, most of the work that I do is historical. And, you know, a lot of the the research and work that I do as it relates to Tantra and the Tantras is is in pre-modern India. And and a lot of those Tantric traditions, they don't necessarily have a living order or an institutionalized form or, you know, a lot of those traditions have died out. Although there are contemporary forms and expressions that that, that do maintain, and and there are living tantra traditions, and so one of the things that's so important about I think your your work and as a, just a case study is that you were working with living traditions, and so that mm-hmm. gives you unique access, mm-hmm. um, and there's so much that we can learn from that, and mm-hmm. so just maybe tell us a little bit, you know, like what it, what is this tradition? What are, what are the sort of rituals and sadhana or religious practices somebody like Gorima is doing? Why, and and why, why would people think she's a prostitute? Like that, I think that might be lost on a lot of listeners. So maybe just kind of explain what's going on in this world. So uh, for that, let's just take one, one example, right? I mean, we have to take a very specific um a practice, when I say example, we'll have to take a, a practice and then kind of weave it through, otherwise it will become very vague to uh, to the listeners. So let's, because we mentioned Kundalini Yoga and you know, it frustrates me how Kundalini Yoga is always perceived in, in the West mm-hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. So let's just take Kundalini Yoga. Now, Kundalini Yoga in, uh, in, in, in Shakta Tantra, uh, especially in Tharapit and say in Kamakya, and uh, th- does that mean other places are not doing it? No, it just means that I have not gone there and I don't know and I've not, you know, I don't have access to those spaces. Um, so when say, for example, um, there is someone uh, now let's take a man, a young man, uh, and in this case, let's call him Mr. Sharma, okay? okay. So let's uh, let's call him Mr. Sharma. So Mr. Sharma, or rather it should be Sarma because, uh, you know, in Assamese, there is uh, the, the sh sound does not exist. It's Sarma. Okay. So Mr. Sarma wants to, um, you know, is, is in Kamakya and Mr. Sarma now wants, to, you know, is is initiated okay and he uh, he has been studying he has been practicing and he has a calling to kind of lean towards the practice of kundalini yoga now all of this please remember would you know it's very very important to uh, to understand is that these things don't just happen or it's not like you wake up one day and you say i want to practice kundalini yoga can i go to the next yoga studio and start practicing kundalini yoga it doesn't work like that in these settings no drop-in classes no drop-in classes no uh you know no yoga globe classes (laughs) Uh, (laughs) but but we'll get to that we'll get to the online stuff i hope yeah a bit because there is some stuff going online right Mm -hmm. but but we'll we'll, we'll stay with mr sarma so so sarma sarma so we have to call him mr sarma so mr sarma therefore you know has a guru and a guru ma and uh, has been a a a student of the guru for uh, has to be a student for the guru for a very long time sometimes like a decade or if not more and uh, he has kind of progressed right he has gone he has progressed on the path he has uh, he's done practices he's studied the text uh, he's integrating practice in text and it's like you know one stage second stage third stage we know there are different stages going up all the way up to abhishekam and then there are more uh, stages after that so he uh, he le- he gets to a point where he now wants to uh, kind of delve more into kundalini yoga now he's a man when he 
wants to learn more about the kundalini yoga of course there are a set of guidelines that his teacher is going to give but a kundalini yoga practice is an embodied practice it's you have to completely internalize and experience the instructions now in this path when we are going through the kundalini yoga training uh, and experiences if you're a man you need a woman okay mm. now this woman if you are married and say your wife is equally interested or your wife is equally advanced then the husband and wife can maybe practice together but mm. that you know the probability of that is very low um you you cannot force someone just because you're married doesn't mean you have the same interest or same caliber or or you will reach the same level i mean we have uh, in yoga vashishta we have Sikhi, uh, shikidwaja and chudala story right i mean it doesn't work like that uh so uh in that case what happens is a partner uh, a sangini or a sakini or however you want to, you know, there are different names they use. A partner will be assigned to you. Now, this partner will be assigned to you by the uh, the community, so by the by the group of gurus or or, or the the akhara. If you're a part of an akhara. Um, it will be part of that community. So there will be someone who will be assigned to you. So if you're a man, chances are you will be assigned a woman. Sometimes you can also be assigned a hijra. And we know hijra is in, mm. in, in the South Asian context can be a blend of both eunuchs and transgender, right? I mean, there is not that kind of a differentiation. So when that happens, you now have a spiritual partner. Now, this spiritual partner is not your spouse. This spirit, but you are going to do some of these bodily practices that, and the bodily practices involve essentially very close to how David White talks about some of the practices and, um, you know, James Madison. I mean, a lot of people have talked about it, um, but essentially you are, starting to, you have to identify the, um, the fluids in your body. And for you to identify the fluids in the body, you need, in this case, you need a partner. Now these partners, the, the spiritual partners or the consorts, they've been trained uh, for, uh, you know, from a very young age to provide that kind of partnership. So yes, as I said, this is very problematic. And that's the reason why I don't think we can just say empowering or abusing because why did they get there? How did they get there? Did they have any choice with regards to becoming a, a, a spiritual partner, right? I mean, it, it's very, 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 very complex. But nevertheless, we are not going to get into that. So now here, Mr. Sarma gets a, a spiritual partner. But because that spiritual partner has not been married to Mr. Sarma, and because the spiritual partner has been a spiritual partner for a very long time, outside of the temple setting, they're seen as loose women. So the, the temple actually, the temple community uh, usually is very protective. They do not disclose uh, who these women are. Some of these women actually live inside, kind of not in Tarapit, they live in, you know, some of them live inside. Some, you know, there are, they have designated spaces where they live, but you can see how, how gray this identity is. Mm -hmm. And that was Gaurima's, uh, you know, bone of contention. And does she identify as a yogini? Or... Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, yeah, it's, it's really a complex space and ritual space and layers of complex issues regarding agency and female empowerment, disempowerment, everything that you just said. Mm -hmm. What kind of um, 
what kind of practices so you were kind of narrating it from the side of our you know our our fake uh sadhaka mr sarma but on the side of gorima mm -hmm. is she, she is also in order to be qualified for that role she is also doing a sadhana she's also purifying her mind and body mm -hmm. she's also progressing on the path let us say and mm -hmm. What is, what is the role of yoga for her as a female practitioner? And that's where I think it gets even more complex. Because, <laughs> and that's where I, uh, I kind of always say they miss the moksha boat. Um, yeah, you, you have that, I, I would say, great phrase. I mean, I guess a pretty, pretty sad descriptive phrase. Women yes. miss the moksha boat. So mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you mean by that? So what happens is while, so in case of Gaurima and Sundarima, they, uh, they, you know, they came into the practice and it's a sad story how they came to the practice. But uh, as I said, keeping that aside, uh, when they came to the practice, um, the first, I think, um, set of trainings, not I think, uh, the first set of trainings that are involved are bodily trainings. Um, how do you, how do we train our yoni? How do we, uh, you know, how do we train our um, our breath? So there's a lot of breath work involved, um, there, and the breath work is very uh, tightly integrated with the female physiological body because the entire practice and uh, we are just talking of kundalini yoga here um, involves uh, you know being able to hold on to your bodily fluids in a certain way and then use certain bandhas uh, and 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 breath to kind of channel it uh, inside our physiological body you know what what we what, what is understood as the hydraulic body of sorts um, so there's a lot of training, a lot, and and some of the training is definitely not pretty, and I don't want to get into it here because you know, know, if you don't mind, in our we're just completing a course at Yogic Studies on the Hatha Pradipika, mm -hmm. and in chapter three on the ten mudras, we of course have Vajroli Mudra, this urethral suction, which mm -hmm. is one of the more controversial bodily seals, mm -hmm. and what's so interesting about it, though, aside from that you have medieval descriptions of yogis sucking fluids up their penises. Mm -hmm. It's one of the few moments in the text where it really very clearly and explicitly says that females can also do this. And that, yes. that, that the, the woman, that the yogini can suck, do this urethral suction. It does not go into very many details and no yeah. surprise written from the male's voice. Right. But that the female adept can withdraw the male's bindu and withdraw mm -hmm. that up. Mm -hmm. And I just put this out to you because I've got you here. I mean, is have you encountered or have you, you know, met any female practitioners or heard of any female practitioners that talk about that practice? Yeah, is that something that's, ex that's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So, so that's exactly you know it's and that's the reason what happens is on the field in these very tight groups the problem is what you will very quickly hear the a sentence followed by uh, by in this training is that it's easy for women and so what they will say and I have it on record they will, they said that it's easy for women to do the vajroli mudra that it's easy for women to channel their fluids so women don't need to practice as much as men do and because of that what happens is between if women are practicing this outside of the marriage right so there is this issue of uh, how society will see you. And then within the community, someone like Gorima or so forth, then when you're constantly being told that it's easy for you, so don't worry, you don't have to practice as much. You just can do it whenever you want to, which 
we know for a fact now that's not true. You need to always have to be able to hold on to some of these, you know, it's, it's a practice, it's an asana, it's, 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 a, it's a mudra, you know, things just because you could do it today uh, effectively does not mean you can do it tomorrow effectively. Body, you know, is different. Um, and the third one, uh, which brings another level is that they will always, you know, I, I was told this uh, where, and I was, you know, again, when I say this to people, especially in the West, everybody gasps and says, oh my God, I mean, how mean, but actually it was not, you know, you have to put everything in context, right? So in the field, there was one particular male guru and he really likes me. He likes me a lot. Okay. And uh, he, Every time he sees me, his blessing is, he, you know, he, he, he cups my face in his hand and he looks into my eyes and he will say, uh, Ma, next, you know, you're doing so well. Your, your practice is so good. Everything is so good. Next time I bless you, come back as a man and your journey will be over. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the reason why I say the women miss the moksha board, because one, they're not practicing as much. Two, they cannot practice because of censorship and, uh, and the fear of how they will be perceived. And three is there is this, you know, another thing that I always say, there is a social cultural DNA uh, that that, you know, we all have. And the social cultural DNA tells us that you have to come back as a man to complete this journey. Mm, yeah, and, it reminds me of, I know there's explicit discussions about this in Buddhist shastras, um, particularly in Tibetan institutions and discourses. Uh, you know, it's something the Dalai Lama has eventually spoken out against. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I mean, there's, there's, you know, even these gendered notions of the marks of an enlightened Buddha. Mm -hmm. and, one of them is the phallus, and, you know, these, these debates and questions about whether one can attain full nirvana or enlightenment within a female body. And sometimes the position has been taken. Right. That they have to be reborn uh, as, as a man. Right. What, and you know, uh, the ahead. reason, sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 no. I, I, I was finished. Yeah, no, the reason I I don't feel, you know, it doesn't hurt me when he when this particular guru says this every time I see him, is because he doesn't mean it in a bad way. He he isn't really looking at world from the gender lens. He don't he you know there is a sincerity in the blessing and I'll take it. Uh, does that mean I, yeah. uh, you know, I believe that I have to come back as a man to, to get moksha or nirvana, whatever I'm seeking, who knows? Uh, no, I'm not going down that path, but I will take that blessing because it comes from, uh, you know, it comes from his heart. He means well, and I think I'll take that blessing anyway. Yeah, it's always struck me as strange, too, because at the same time, these very same texts and traditions and teachings are, are constantly reemphasizing that, you know, one's svarupa or true nature, svabhava, their identity is not limited to the body. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not limited this to the to one's personality, to their mental makeup, to their gender. The yeah. true nature is the Atman, the Purusha, transcends materiality. Right. And yet, but yet, you know, you're, you're, you're embodied. And so we do have to deal with the body, don't we? Yes, it is. It is what it is. Yeah. But, and, but you know, that's what goes to the ritual space again, right? I mean, it's, it's fascinating to see in these, and again, I'm not for one saying, you know, this is it and it doesn't happen in the other traditions like Shava, uh, Kashmir Shaivism or Sri Vidya tradition. I, I, you know, it's, I'm not saying that, but just because I study what I study and, you know, I practice what I practice and I come from where I come from, um, these esoteric spaces are so powerful. They have, they, they give us so much insight into as simple or as complex as gender and, and how we can operate and, and, and kind of, you know, kind of 
play with this fluidity and therefore where you know how how do i experience and and from very little very little of what i know how i will experience would be very different from another person to the third to the fourth to the fifth yeah and i think it is really important to highlight that this is a really specific and even regional case study that you're talking mm-hmm. about and can't we can't say that this represents the category of tantra or even shakta no. tantra you know more no. you know universally mm-hmm. and that kind of helps me you know kind of get to the next thing here and something you already brought up is the the public perception of just even the term even the word tantra um both in india today and in the west mm-hmm. and it's sort of um i think exaggerated claims and oftentimes stereotyped caricatured understandings of a highly sexualized tantra because mm-hmm. we have these examples like like what you're talking about and sharing with us in detail and i think so it's quite easy for somebody to walk away and say oh you know tantra was all about this ritual sex yeah, so we, yeah. we really have to be so careful about the context um uh, and, and, and all of these layers of, of issues that, that we've been discussing, that nonetheless, people have very much walked away with those impressions, written books about it, mm-hmm. an entire history of the, I mean, I, I want to say the, the West's interaction with Tantra in India, but it, but it's also, it's, it's indigenous within India. So it's more complicated than that of how exactly. I... themselves have mm-hmm. viewed Tantra and tantrikas, right? Yeah, yeah. I, so I what can what share with us just a little bit, like what is the public perception of tantra? And then I wanted to like lead this then into when we advertised for your course, your yogic studies course, on Facebook, yeah. our ads were blocked. This is the first time that this really happened to me. We advertised yeah. your course on Shakta Tantra, yoga and Hindu goddess traditions, and I mean, I'm very careful the way I word, you know, these descriptions. And it was very clearly an educational course. It had nothing to do with some, you know, sexual couples retreat in California (laughs) or anything like that. Anything like other ads I have seen online, I'll have to say. Right. And we totally, we got flagged. You know, as you know, we really went through it with Facebook, trying to get these ads. We were writing letters to Facebook. I think you wrote an email to Mark Zuckerberg. Is that right? I wrote to everybody on uh, on uh, Facebook. Nobody responded, obviously. <laughs> obviously. But it was like, I mean, it was so ironic because here we were trying to offer an educational course to critically, constructively, understand quote unquote a traditional indian and hindu form of tantra and because of the broader public distorted understandings based on you know what we might call neo tantra we couldn't even offer this course on the quote unquote traditional hindu tantra because of i think just the words tantra were were flagging the system I tried so many times, Shravana, to change the ads. I swapped images to make sure there was nothing, you know, sexually licentious in it. Um, And we kept getting flagged that it was in violation of Facebook's adult content policy. And And um, we couldn't, we couldn't advertise it. Yep. And I remember them sending us examples. Did you, do you remember the examples they sent us? Oh my gosh. (laughs) I I hesitate to ask, do you you even describe what those examples were? (laughs) I, I, I was joking among friends. I said, did you know I've become a porn star? <laughs> oh my gosh. It was like, it was so offensive, wasn't it? Because That's the ad so had offensive. your very professional photo of you um, in your office. And yeah. then they were saying, here's some examples of why this is offensive. Yeah. And I think it was like a white woman in lingerie yeah. peeling a banana or something like yeah. that. Was, yeah, exactly. What? Yeah, yeah. But, but that's what we're dealing with, right? I mean, and and I don't having seen, you know, and again, as scholars, we look at we look at the history of transmission. We know what happened in the 1800s. We have to look at uh, the Theosophists and 
and the transmission and, uh, and the counterculture and even things like definition of celibacy, um, you know, um, the, 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 the Abrahamic uh, lens, uh, Abrahamic religious lens onto some of these, mm. uh, these traditions, rituals, understanding. I mean, it's super duper complex, yeah. uh, but, you know, if you were to do the super duper complex, but essentially the minute you say Tantra, what people think of is sex, people think of black magic. Uh, people in think India, of- right? I think in the West, they wouldn't think of black magic in the West. So that's actually no. an important difference. No, I, I disagree. Oh, really? Yeah, I used to also think this whole black magic witch thing is more of an Indian narrative. But then, you know, I worked with the United Nations Human Rights Commission on um, on this whole, uh, you know, problem of witchcraft and mm-hmm. uh, the violence against uh, people branded as witches. Uh, uh, and this is nothing to do with just women, but women, and children. It's very complicated. Well, no. the, there's, well there's definitely um, a serious history and engagement of what we might call Western esotericism mm-hmm. with Indian Tantra. Mm-hmm. People like Alistair Crowley and others who I, I would say pretty seriously engaged with those traditions, of, you know, Western traditions of magic coming into contact with elements of, of, of Indian Tantra. But I guess I would say that's still pretty niche within the within the West. Like I would say just I think the broader public mainstream, if you, if you, yes know, if you said no. to somebody you're teaching a course on Tantra, the kind of rolled eyes you'll get, you know. <laughs> Yes, Which I'm sure you faced before. <laughs> yes, and, and then you know, uh, I I still remember, you know, and, and the kind of comments people make, right? I mean, now I've gotten used to just laughing. Uh, earlier, I used to be like so shocked. I used to be like, wait are you actually saying what you're saying? Uh, but now, and I've just, you know, I've just decided to just laugh and make jokes about it and just move on. Mm. Uh, but, but essentially, I think, I think it's, it's complex. Uh, it's complex because we also have to look at um, smarter uh, Hinduism, right? The entire movement of, uh, of mm-hmm. cleansing the Hindu tradition. Yeah. Uh, we also have to look at uh, reform Hindu the movements and I'm just talking historically because I think it's not fair to put all the blame of Tantra being understood as this um, uh, uh, you know as uh, in, in such negative light uh, to just the West I think I think there is a lot that was happening within the uh, the larger Hindu uh, space that kind of kept pushing Tantra more and more and more to the back. Mm. And, um, and yeah, something... there's a lot of there's historically a lot of Tantra bashing. Oh in my India. god! I mean the the, oh my, the yes. bhaktas, the the bhakti yes. devotional traditions. They really yes. have a go at the tantrikas uh-huh. all the way as you said, to like the Brahmo Samaj and these reforms. Yes, the Arya Samaj, yes, absolutely. Arya Samaj, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, what happens is if you look at this, the, the, the larger Indo-Gangetic plane Hindu uh, space, we find, and even today you find this Shakta Tantra or Tantra per se, not so much uh, in in the front and center. I mean, uh, we have even things like, you know, animal sacrifice therefore becomes a problem in Himachal Pradesh. Uh, Goddesses like Hadimba are, you know, uh, are kind of uh, given a more, you know, the domestication of goddesses. I mean, Sanjukta Sanjukta Gupta wrote about it, which I really uh, use a lot, but essentially you see domestication of goddesses. But what happens in in Assam and Parapet and places like this is that, you know, that, that kind of integration, that kind of cleansing, what I call the Victorian morality cleansing, didn't really reach these uh, like Kamakya and Tarapit and, and so forth. So I borrow from Hugh Urban and I think he came up with a very nice term called this is hybrid Hinduism. 
and uh, and that's what we find and that's the reason why some of these traditions that otherwise kind of went away into hiding and we know when something goes into hiding you're bound to lose it right uh, it's it it stayed here and then we have now another round of cleansing with the Hindutva movement, right? We have another round of Hindu identity. Who is a Hindu? How should a Hindu behave? How should a Hindu pray? How should a Hindu dress? It's, it's shocking, you know, in Diwali, for example, in parts of West Bengal, Assam, Tripura, uh, you know, states like this, it, uh, Orissa also, you have Kali Puja, right? Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily doing Diwali as it's celebrated in the north of India or south of India. And so last three, four years during Diwali, you will see advertisements and these giant hoardings showcasing how you dress in Diwali, how you should be fasting for Navratri, how you should be you know, conducting yourself uh, it, it during, uh, dur and I'm just giving an example of Diwali. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there and thinking, wait, what, what if I don't, what if Diwali is more of Kali Puja for me? And what if I do animal sacrifice? And what if I don't want to dress up like you are dressing up? I mean, when did clothes, but we can see how Hindu identity is coming up. So it's, it's in America, I'm just thinking, you know, we have the war, so-called war on Christmas and perhaps in the, in the Northeast, uh, India is the war on Diwali. It's not yet there, but it's getting there. Okay. But it's it's, it's yeah. getting there. I would say war on Kali Puja. So but it's a, you... it's a it's a it's a example of a real clash of yes. kind of the top down, top meeting the down of the of the uh, you know the government and this increasingly mainstream notion of what Hinduness or Hindutva is and mm -hmm. how. That should be represented, even in someone's clothes or dress on a on a holiday, mm -hmm. and then what people actually do and practice mm -hmm. in all of the diversity and richness of what falls under the category of Hinduism. Right, right. Uh, you won't believe this. It was in yesterday's news. Uh, uh, a high court in in West Bengal uh, actually, um, you know, allowed for a divorce because this woman refused to wear sindoor the red vermilion mm -hmm. and the uh, the shakha pola which is the white and the red bang bangle that signifies uh, a married woman mm. wow. and she said i won't and, and 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 that that became a contention for divorce and the court allowed it mm. So, so going back to Tantra, because otherwise we're going to, you know, get into Hindutva and Hindu identity. Yeah, go back to Tantra, but I yeah. also want to, um, I want to shift us a little bit. We'll keep on this topic, but of thinking about how things are changing and get into some of your, your work of Tantra on the internet and online Tantric pujas. So right. you kind of take us there and how your work has shifted into the digital space. Right. So, uh, so, so, so going back to the Tantra, I think, I think, you know, there is, there is a very complex history where both, uh, you know, the East and the West have to be looked at together to come to this, uh, this, this space where we reach where, you know, as you said, even in Facebook, we could not put up an advertisement for my course, right. Uh, so, Tantra does get very closely associated uh, with everything that, you know, uh, we don't want to talk about, uh, you know, magic, sex, um, you know, illicit relationships, uh, consorts, and so consorts are then seen as prostitutes, uh, then, you know, how you, how you define celibacy, and so forth. So all of this kind of gets uh, into this very, very murky uh, definition of Tantra. Um, but what I have been noticing, and that's what I have written last three, um, you know, my, my three chapters for three different edited volumes, has been uh, the space of internet. What I'm finding interesting is a blend. Um, so 
the online puja when we look at online puja which is you know you can you go online and you can order a puja <laughs> right uh, and uh, which is yeah. quite, that's quite something just that right there you can go online and order mm-hmm. uh, a puja ritual worship yeah what, and you know for, for what sort of things are people ordering puja oh. online and where do you go how do you order a puja Oh, oh my God, you can go, you can just do order online puja and you will get zillions of, uh, you know, websites. Uh, I'll give you an example of one, shukpuja.com. The reason I give shukpuja.com is because Forbes called it, uh, Forbes or New York Times, I don't know, somebody uh, called it the Uber for God. Oh, wow. And yeah. Just, and just, just, just to clarify, this episode is not sponsored by shubpuja.com. We have no affiliate. <laughs> thank you thank you for uh specifying oh, that we should. We sh- you should get we you have should, to and we don't have any have a, yeah a, Yes, and we 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 are not uh, sponsored by any other websites that I may land up uh, talking about. The reason I'm talking of Shapuja is because you asked me where do you go and do it. So I was no, and and you focus on that in one in one of your recent articles, yes. right? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, so essentially, you can go. So you can get services like uh, puja room cleaning. So if you have a uh, Diwali coming up or a festival coming up, like Ganesh Puja coming up, and you want your uh, puja space to be cl- cleaned ritualistically, you can actually, like, you know, Molly Maids, uh, I don't know if Molly Maids is a, a US-based thing, but it's in Houston. So you can, you know, you have maid services that you can call to come clean your house. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, they come certified. Similarly, you can get people who are certified to come clean your puja rooms. Uh, you can then order pujas for anything and everything from um you know you uh, you got a promotion and you want to say thank you you can order a puja online um, so you, this is so this is you're ordering it online and then the pujari is coming to your physical space no 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 there is no ritual? physical space no it's all digital it's all digital. So you order. So if you order a cleaning service, of course, it's physical space. They have to right. come to your house to clean. But other than that, it's all digital. So uh, how this works when you look at online, of course, uh, you know, so you order this puja. So for example, uh, say I'm expecting a, a promote or I'm, I'm kind of contesting or I'm in the mix to get a promotion. Okay. And I want to get a puja done so that I get this promotion. So I go online. And as I said, there are lots of websites. And then I can go there and I can order a puja to be done for my promotion. I will then give my name, my date of birth, um, and so on and so forth. I will pay by credit card. It's like Amazon. You are basically shopping for any puja you want. Um, like you would do on Amazon. So you can have Flipkart, Amazon. Uh, I don't know. What else do we have to to buy online? But whatever we have, I don't know so many websites. So what, um, do, you say, what do you say to somebody who, who says, no, I know you're, you're the scholar. You're, you're, you're analyzing this and trying to um, read it, you know, yeah. without, without uh, you know, emotionally judging it or anything. But or I, I'm, I know part of your analysis is looking at the discourses around this, around authenticity. You know, how, how does moving into the online sphere, how, 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 are, how is this then deemed authentic? How does one judge one online pujari from another? Um, I, I, I can just imagine people saying, oh, this is just the commercialization of religion mm-hmm. to another degree. You know, you, mm-hmm. you're, buying, you're buying religion, you're buying and selling pujas. So how, how are those sorts of discussions, um, what, are, what, what are the kind of the contours of those conversations as you found in your work? So authenticity and authority are very, very, um, you know, they've already been um, written quite a bit uh, with, when it comes to online puja. Hein Scheifinger, Heidi Campbell, these are uh, scholars that have written about it. Um, but I am uh, on the camp of uh, Scheifinger, uh, who basically says that it's like darshan, mm-hmm. right? If as a devotee, if I am experiencing the embodied elements of darshan, through online puja, then it is authentic. 
in terms of the puja. In terms of the pujari, uh, you basically do research, you read testimonials, um, and all these websites provide detailed testimonials. Uh, they have uh, CVs of the, uh, of the pujari, so you can look at the pujari and you can say, huh, uh, you are experienced, you're not experienced, or, uh, or you know, you will read the testimonials. And they have say, like ratings like Uber? They have like, ratings. They have a five-star yes. pujari rating? Absolutely, they have ratings. And I think the, the sweetest thing I saw, which cracked me up, and even now it does is, and one testimonial that I was uh, going through in detail, uh, one of them said, I uh, ordered this puja and, uh, yeah, but I didn't, uh, but I did not get the result from the puja. Can I get my money back? Mm, right. I'm sure that. <laughs> right. So happen. now we From are, we have moved from, uh, we, we moved into this commodity, right? It's a service and a provider. So this is online puja. So this is very, very internet. So this is very, you go well, on the one internet. Could, one could question if that's actually anything new, right? Uh, it is. You know, it, uh, okay. the, the, the context and the immediacy perhaps has, has really changed. Right. And but they, in terms of um, a kind of almost a consumer-like transaction between patron and ritual specialist, that's something really ancient, goes all the way back to mm -hmm. the period, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And even historically, they, it's always, you know, when somebody goes to a temple, you would say, hey, can you do, uh, can you put 101 rupees for me? Or can you, uh, can you light a dia for me, right? Mm -hmm. So those things have always existed. It's just that now it's more on a, um, on a, on a commodity website, uh, you know, and, and they actually have a cart. So you put things in your cart, then you check out mm -hmm. your cart. So it's, it's really the Amazon experience uh, pretty much mm -hmm. that you're getting. Interesting. But while I was looking at this online puja, which is this very, very, as I said, you know, um, whoever said New, New York Times, I think, or whoever said Uber for God, while I was researching this, I came to this app called WhatsApp. Sure. Now, WhatsApp has kind of completely brought a different angle into it. WhatsApp is on my phone. Yeah. WhatsApp is now, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can, you can chat, you can video call, you can, and it's, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and encrypted. So, you know, it's, there, there is some, they believe there's some level of secrecy, although Facebook owns WhatsApp. Um, but, oh, I didn't know that. Did mm -hmm. they bought WhatsApp? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting, but essentially, what is happening when I'm looking at WhatsApp is, you know, you ask that question about the Pujari. So if I have access to some Pujaris or if I have access to some of these websites who also give me access to the Pujari through WhatsApp, uh, and again, going back to, again, just an example sake, shopuja.com, as you rightly said, we are not promoting Shopuja, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but, you know, when I look at it, so you will find they have a whole, they, they, in the testimonials, they have like this carousel going where they have WhatsApp messages between the Pujari and the client. Mm. And so in WhatsApp, what I'm seeing now more and more is that a, a, a greater uh, comfort in sharing and a greater comfort in asking. So, uh, you know, as long as it was, say, you wanted to do rituals like, can, you know, I, I just passed my exam. Can you do a thank you puja or can you do, you know, like simple pujas, I think online was happening or I had a, you know, uh, you buy a new house, you can say, can you do a puja for me? And then they will send you the prashad. They will send you uh, maybe some fabric uh, by courier and you can keep them in your house, right? As blessed yeah, I'm looking at the website right now, actually, shubpuja.com. You can do it for love, marriage, and relationship, mm -hmm. family and children, money and career, legal mm -hmm. puja, uh, yep. black magic and evil eyes. Ooh, yes. Category. 
But then when it comes to black magic and evil eye, you, when you go further and further, and there are several websites that will do it, the more you dig, you will find slowly the, the radical results you want. People then start moving into WhatsApp. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, for example, if I want Vashikaran, right, done on someone, mm-hmm. or if I, uh, if I want uh, Maran uh, performed on someone, then I am no longer comfortable putting that on the, uh, on my cart. What, and what are those, just for the... For so the- Vashikaran is if you want to um, take hold of someone. So, you know, you want someone to fall in love with you. Uh, I'm just giving one. There are several examples of Ashikaran, but I'm just saying if, if someone doesn't love you, but you want uh, that person to, uh, to start loving you, you can, you know, you believe you can get a Vashikaran uh, puja done, or you want your enemy dead, or you want someone in your family to die, uh, you can get, you can get uh, a Maran puja done. Now, I have no idea about their efficacy. I don't know if it actually happens, but, you know, it's, it's very, very much part of the space. Now, uh, wow. when, sorry, were you saying? Oh, just that? saying, wow, that's, you know, uh, to be able to order that online. That yes, but you see there, something. I don't want my cart, my historic cart to show I did a Vashikaran puja. No, you need to do that on the dark web. Yes, so the dark web <laughs> is the oh, WhatsApp no. and online puja. You got it. And you know what, Seth, if I have your permission, I need to use your dark web example for my chapter that I'm just currently working on. Of course. I mean, I no, it's not mine, you know. Um, I, yeah, no, but you came up with it in this context. So, yes. You know, so be WhatsApp, interesting to look at. Yeah, so WhatsApp is the dark web of online puja. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and because so it doesn't it doesn't leave the same digital trace. Although it probably depends on what your transaction history settings are on your WhatsApp and everything. But I, I think the point you make is that it moves into this more personalized sphere, mm-hmm. whereas the forums and the reviews and testimonials are more of like this online public sphere, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow, so and fascinating. And if you look at the testimonials again deeper, you will start seeing, I mean, you really have to keep going, 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 but you will start seeing people saying, oh, you know, I fi- I f- he finally loves me and I am so happy. And you're like, uh-huh, <laughs> someone really finally loves you. Which puja did you get done? <laughs> you know, and you know, I mean, if you are, uh, if now, someone- now, do you think, you know, as a scholar, how do you, how do you look at those? I mean, um, are they are they sincere? Are they? Um, it's hard to evaluate those kind of highly personalized testimonials like that, right? But In terms of e- de- efficacy, right? But who defines efficacy and sincerity? exactly? Right. I mean, and that's why I don't use the traditional sui generis uh, model of religious experience, because there we assume we needed some level of authority or something to define this is religious, this is not religious, this is efficacy, you know, there is level of efficacy or lack of it or authority or authenticity. Who are we to judge that? My thing is, I don't have that right. If that girl is writing all this gushy, happy text saying how the guy is now going to leave his wife and is uh, has fallen in love with her. And this only happened because so-and-so Pandaji did this, this, this puja for her and how, you know, it's, it's effective for her. That's it. That's, that's where it begins and ends. Mm. Yeah. Right. That's that's my take. Now, someone might say, oh, no, there's that and the other. But I I feel if 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 the if the client in this case or if the uh, if the devotee in this case is happy, is happy. If the devotee says it was authentic, it's authentic. If the devotee believes by looking at the five star rating or the, you know, similar to Yelp rating, if they decide this particular website and this particular set of pujaris, because some of the pujas require 11 pujaris or 13 pujaris. And if they feel the Yelp rating of the pujaris was correct, it's correct. Who am I to say it's wrong? Mm. Wow. Fascinating. And I'm sure now, you know, during COVID times and shelter oh in place God. and quarantine, uh, 
you know, digital it's puja. Rolling if, you, business. If, you bought, if you bought stock in digital puja, it's probably, <laughs> probably really seen an uptick in all seriousness because yeah. uh, it's really, I mean, as online is, it, it, you know, because of COVID affecting every single industry, every sphere of, mm-hmm. of life and work mm-hmm. and religion and ritual and politics and economy and everything. So I'm sure uh, there's been a huge surge in this, in this sort of activity during this time. Have you been keeping up on that? Oh my God, yes. And I have to say, so, you know, this is, you know, there's a goddess called Sheetala. Right. Right. The, coo- and the cooling one. What do you mean cooling? She's the one who protects you from viruses and germs and bacterias and. Uh, but but the name Shitala or Shitali, cooling, right? Cold, the cold one in Sanskrit. The, the yeah. Yeah, but but so, so cooling the infection, right? I mean, so she was very popular for smallpox, for example. Yes. Right. And so she she rides a donkey. She has a broom in her hand and uh, she has a pot of purified uh, water or rather a pot in her hand. So I have to give you this exa- uh, this particular because you mentioned COVID. So I was in March. I, I actually was in India in March and I left India the night just the night before uh, India shut down its borders uh, due to COVID. Oh. Uh, so I was in India and I was in Assam and I, I was in Kamakya and uh, there was, um, you know, on Facebook, uh, there are now pujas being offered on Facebook Live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of that. Yes. Yeah, so there was uh, in March when this whole COVID thing was on the rise, uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, Sheetala Puja being performed. So I, I got super excited and uh, I used WhatsApp to WhatsApp my group of girlfriends in Houston. And I was like, guys, guys. And I, and I was sending all kinds of pictures from these temples of how they were dealing with COVID, right? Because um, uh, it was just so fascinating. Like there was a picture uh, that I took where uh, a shivalingam uh, was, uh, a mask was put on a shivalingam. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I, yeah. yeah. And so I thought that was so cute. Right. And, uh, and, and I was like, okay, wait, why is the lingam got a mask? But you know, it, we all know why uh, mm-hmm. and, and devotion and so forth. So mm-hmm. I was taking all these pictures and sending. So I sent this to two of my friends in Houston and they went, they just took off. They were like, ha, ah, a goddess on a donkey, ha, ah, um, you know, uh, she has a broom, ha, ah, they have a, uh, she's carrying a pot of water. And they just went on and on and on. And I was getting more and more agitated, okay? And I was really having a very, very strong reaction. The more they, uh, they laughed about Sheetala, the more I was reacting. And I was finding it very fascinating saying, why am I reacting? They're not, they're not making fun in a bad way, right? I mean, they're, they're being scientific. They're saying, come on. I mean, we cannot, uh, you know, control COVID by just praying to this goddess, right? So they were being very scientific. They were taking on a, a, a very different lens. And here I was, you know, and I, then I was like, and that is what led to me thinking more and more about WhatsApp online COVID because end of the day, they had that puja on Facebook Live. I had 2.1K followers uh, mm-hmm. live watching it. Mm-hmm. And so my thing was if they had that many followers uh, you know, watching and, 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 and driving and deriving some kind of comfort and feeling protected, feeling uh, like they are, um, they're being, you know, given some kind of protection by this goddess, then it's valid. Then it is as good as going to a temple because how is it different? And COVID has completely changed it. Mm. There are many, many websites uh, on Facebook Live that now offer everyday evening pujas, morning pujas, and you can follow them. You will get one pop-up saying they're going live. 
and you can chant with them. I know people that chant with, uh, with these pujas. They pray, they write, light diyas, they light agarbattis, incense sticks, and, um, and it's, 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 it's good for them. Yeah, I, I mean, just like any everything else, it's shifted online and it now yeah. provides valuable service for people who want to access these practices, these rituals, who can't right. go to the temple, who who trying to practice, you know, uh, social distancing, physical mm -hmm. distancing. Uh, and who's to say, you know, if they're experiencing those benefits. Um, right. And there are. Uh, and it's, I think, important to talk about there are three or four different categories. So there are like online puja companies, right? So that's like your shapuja.com, divinerudrak.com, and onlinepuja.com. So those are your, your Amazon equivalent of puja. Okay. Then you have temples. So right. uh, like Minakshi temple, uh, uh, Ramakrishna Mat temple, Kamakya temple, you know, uh, all and these they've got temples, their own social media channels, right? Then they have their own, and they then again do uh, online pujas there, right? So yeah. that's second. Then there are pundits or gurus or how whatever they want to call themselves, the mahans and so forth. They have their own again websites and pages and Facebook where they go live and they perform pujas and they perform even you know. Um, uh, like sessions, uh, dedicated sessions. So that's a third category. And as I said, you have the fourth category of the dark web, which is the WhatsApp. So, mm -hmm. so there are there are several different ways by which you can access God in this case, divine through internet. And just like online courses, right? That they're mm -hmm. not limited by geography. You can right. now do a puja at Kamakya. Uh huh. Right from your home in Houston or and California. Courier, yeah, and they will courier you your after the puja. They will courier you the dry prashad because obviously they can't send the wet prashad, and they will send you either if you've got something by which say they need to send you the ash of a havan, they will send that to you, or they will send you holy cloth from the kun, uh, and that will come by FedEx or DHL. Well, there you go. All right, Shravana, I think uh, we, we should definitely start to wrap things up here. Um, this has been an absolutely uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, so I thank you so much for uh, sharing you know, your story and this really interesting work with us and taking us into these traditions in more detail, uh, you know, pulling the curtain back for us a bit. Uh, before we sign off, is there any anything else any anything we didn't get to touch on or any any final words that you wanted to share with listeners um just one and this comes from the course that i taught with you uh through yogic studies platform uh the element of fear and i didn't i knew about it but i didn't really um I didn't really delve into it much, but I think the course I taught with you and all the emails and that have come since then, um, you know, WhatsApp messages or, me or, or messages on Messenger is, there is this inherent fear saying, if I do this, am I doing this wrong in the sense that will, will the goddess get angry or will, will I be punished? Am I, am I good enough to do this? Or, um, you know, can I draw a beja mantra because it is spontaneously rising in my heart or someone saying, can I, can I put this mantra in my shrine? Because I, there's something about the mantra that you shared in this course that resonated with me, uh, um, is, is it allowed? I, I've always, and this is my answer, and I, you know, I, we, we, I'm hoping to reach out to more people through this platform. It's fear psychosis comes from control, right? Someone sitting and saying, you're doing this right or you're doing this wrong. I've always said the goddess, God, universe, gender, ungender, third gender, I don't want to get into that is benevolent, has the largest ever heart. Do what comes naturally to you, follow your heart. You want to paint the goddess, 
paint the goddess. You want to sing a song which is not coming from a set of scripture, but it spontaneously rises in you, go for it. You want to print a mantra and paste it in your home because you feel there is something coming from that mantra, you, you should just do it. And I don't think you need permission or any one of us needs permission to, to follow our heart and seeking the divine. Uh, and that's what I want to leave with. Well, well, thank you. And and to connect it back to to your story, you know, you you had this fear of of, of sharing Gorima's story and mm -hmm. becoming a scholar, a public scholar of Shakta Tantra. But mm -hmm. you you persevered, and you and you followed your heart and intuition on that. And uh, and I think it's worked out pretty well for you. And I think we're all grateful that you did that. And uh, I just have to share with listeners, I forgot to mention this uh, earlier, uh, but congratulations on the recent uh, position at Harvard University. Uh, Shravana has recently been offered a, a lectureship at Harvard. And um, so obviously you made the right decision and your work has not uh, you know, that those fears, I think, have been perhaps slowly, slowly alleviated and, you know, certainly getting getting that position at Harvard, I hope, I hope in some small way recognizes uh, oh the God, great work yes. that you're doing. Yes, no, Harvard does. Harvard, uh, you know, it was the, as I always say, I remember reading this book called Audacity of Hope by Obama. And uh, this was my audacity of hope and, uh, and, and universe's acknowledgement. Um, but you know, I, what I'm seek, telling the listeners is to, uh, in the ritual space, just follow your heart. You cannot go wrong. It's okay if you didn't, did not chant one day. It's okay if you did not light a dia one day. You'll not be cursed or nothing bad will come to you. You know, we seek the divine with love and it is love that will carry us forward. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Shravana. Uh, it's been a really wonderful conversation. I'm sure our listeners will enjoy and um i think we'll we'll leave it there for now i wish you well and staying safe and uh, i look forward to talking with you again soon thank you seth and i wish the same to you and to all our listeners stay safe be well and yep we will be in touch take care okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.